Another piece of legislation introduced in the name of Brexit, which we were repeatedly told was about restoring Parliament's sovereignty and supremacy, and yet what this bill is about is giving ministers absolute control yep. over whole swathes of legislation that impact upon our national life by cutting members of Parliament out of the process almost altogether, and the public as well. This is what the Hansard Society had to say. The bill, and I quote, sidelines Parliament because it proposes to let all retained EU law expire on the sunset deadline unless ministers decide to save it with no parliamentary input or oversight. This is a shocking bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. As I see it, one of the main purposes is presentational. It's really trying to remove the words Europe, European, EU from the statute book. It's a form of linguistic and legislative purge, which may make those who argue to leave the EU feel better, but it doesn't add to the sum total of human <coughs> happiness, because the business secretary, the former business secretary, has just left. Uh, made it crystal clear what the aim was when he wrote to me on the 13th of October and said that the bill will require departments to remove unnecessary or burdensome laws which encumber business and no longer meet the government's policy objectives. Well, I remind the House that one person's burdensome law is another person's safe working conditions. It's their right to take parental leave. Yep. And I say that because at a time of great uncertainty and economic difficulty, what the bill does is simply, and we've heard this from others who've spoken, is add to the uncertainty. Now think of businesses, and the point was brilliantly made by my honourable friend who speaks from the opposition front bench. What businesses want to know is what are the rules, what's the framework, because that knowledge provides them with certainty on the basis of which they can invest and carry out their work. And what's the government doing? It's doing the absolute opposite in this bill. It's saying to every one of those businesses and every one of the would-be investors, you know what, the laws and the regulations are the rules that are in place today. Well, we just need to point out they may not be in place in the same form uh, after uh, Christmas 2023 if we don't get around to saving them. And I must say, I can't think of an approach more calculated to undermine confidence in the British economy uh, and to deter would-be investors than what is doing in this, this bill is seeking to do. And I would just point out, we're not doing very well on inward investment. We have the lowest level of inward investment in the whole of the G7. And part of the problem is, I have no idea, I don't think the government has any idea, which bits of EU law they want to scrap, which bit of law they want to amend and retain, or which bits of law they want to keep in its entirety. Now, we know there's a list. Reference has been made to it. It's not a little list. It's a jolly big list, and it's found in the famous uh, dashboard. And I echo the plea of those who've made this point. I really hope they've counted everything. <laughs> I mean, to paraphrase Lord Denning's famous <laughs> phrase, now that the incoming tide of EU law has ebbed away, have ministers and civil servants searched every estuary every river, every tributary, every salt marsh, to make sure they've found all of the bits of legislation that will be subject to this bill. Now, it's really important they have done so, because if they've missed anything, that bit of legislation will fall in December next year. <coughs> it will disappear from the statute, but whether ministers wanted to do it or not. Now, the next thing that's objectionable about this bill is that for the first time I can recall, it allows ministers to change the law of this country by doing nothing, by simply watching the clock move or the pages of the calendar fall until December 2023 comes around. And even if, I say this to members on opposite, even if they agree with the aim of reviewing laws, and there's an argument to be had, it is extraordinary that ministers are asking the House to give them this power. Now, I did put to the minister who is no longer in his place, and I echo those who say he did a, a good job moving a bill, having come to this uh, very, very recently, but he had no answer to the point I put to him, and I've yet to hear one in the debate, as to why ministers should be allowed 
to get rid of law simply by sitting on their hands. You cannot call... Oh, of course you'll give way. William Kerr. Uh, of course, the Honourable Gentleman is rather avoiding the point that actually the legislation, when it did come in, was done with exactly the same arrangements and imposed upon us by the Council of Ministers by majority vote behind closed doors, and he knows it. Well, what I do know is I sat on the Council of Ministers for seven years as a Cabinet Minister and took part in discussions and decisions about directives. This is a point the Right Honourable Gentleman never, ever, ever mentions. It was like everybody was locked out of the room. But he makes that argument to avoid addressing what is in this bill and saying that something in the past wasn't perfect and I happen to agree with him about the fact that we weren't allowed to watch the Council of Ministers at work. I agree with him. It's not an argument for what is proposed in the legislation that is before us today. And what's more, are ministers seriously arguing that, given all the pressures, the things that the new Prime Minister no doubt wants to do, that civil servants should spend time going through 2,417 pieces of legislation? Good luck to the new DEFRA Secretary. 570 pieces of legislation, DFT 424, Treasury 374, between now and next Christmas to decide what on earth to do about them. And while they're valiantly trying to do this, there's absolutely no provision for public consultation. There will be no impact assessment on any changes they are proposing to make. And I have to say, it takes a particular type of genius to make an enemy of worthy organisations like Wildlife and Countryside Link, the Green Alliance and others, by threatening that which we and they value uh, in pursuit of a headline. And what about workers' rights? Because what exactly is the government's intention in detail when it comes to the Working Time Directive? I say that because we've often heard ministers argue, uh, complain about bits of the consequences of the Working Time Directive. Other times we've heard them say, under no circumstances will we weaken worker protection. <coughs> and uh, the Minister did acknowledge that we have entered into certain commitments as a country. Mind you, that's not a guide uh, that the government is ever going to keep to those if the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is anything to go by. That there are certain employment and environmental uh, uh, legislative commitments which are engaged by the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And we all know what happens if we act in a way that the EU thinks gives us an unfair competitive advantage, they can retaliate. And how is that going to help economic growth if we are inviting the prospect of that happening? Now, I did listen very carefully to the commitment the Minister made from the dispatch box on environmental and employment laws, but I'm sorry to say it's still not clear what he means by that because it is the detail that matters. It's the detail uh, that matters, what will be changed and what will be kept the same. Now, the final point I want to make is that there is uh, the section of the bill that does its best to tell the courts what they can and cannot take into account when <coughs> considering cases before them. Now, the government tried to do this previously with the Withdrawal Act, and it's back having another go. And there is one section of the bill which is extraordinary. Clause 7, subsection 3 says, and I quote, In deciding whether to depart from any retained EU case law, the higher court concern must, among other things, have regard to the extent to which the retained EU case law restricts the proper development of domestic law. Would any member care to stand up and explain what is the proper development of domestic law? Law. And I think Clause 7 is really trying to kick the judiciary again to be a bit more enthusiastic <coughs> uh, about Brexit. But ministers know that in the end, the courts will take into account the things that they think are relevant. And I tell you what I think will happen here is after all of this song and dance and chess beating about this wonderful new freedom, um, this will happen. There isn't one sunset clause in this bill, there are three sunset clauses. There is 31st of December 20. Uh, 23. There is the 30th of June 2026, and the third is forever, because under Clause 1, Subsection 2, ministers can decide to retain EU law in perpetuity or until such time as they choose to cha change it. And therefore, I wager that as next December approaches, lots of ministers will find lots of reasons <coughs> why they're going to use Clause 1, 2, because they won't have had time to decide what to do with the legislation. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, this is a bad bill. 
It threatens lots of laws that people value. It creates uncertainty. It takes powers away from the House. It allows ministers to repeal the law by doing nothing. And for all of these reasons, it should be rejected. Here, here.